Hello students, today we will discuss about the norma occipitalis part of the skull. Now whenever you are holding the skull in your hand, you are having the different view like norma verticalis, norma frontalis, norma lateralis, norma basalis and norma occipitalis. So today we are going to see this skull from the posterior side where you will have the occipital bone and this view is known as norma occipitalis. Now what are the important things which you should know about this view of the skull that norma occipitalis is convex upward and on each side and it is flattened below. That means when you will see it from the posterior side you will find that it is having a convexity but as you will go downward it will become flat. Now what are the bones which you will have on this posterior view? So first is you have the major portion of the occipital bone which we are able to see from the posterior side. So this is your bone which you can see here. Now this is your occipital bone and apart from the occipital bone on the upper side you will find the parietal bones which are present on right and left side. But when you will see the on the sides, on the sides you will find this small projection of the temporal bone. So what are the bones you will have? You will have two temporal bones, two parietal bone and single large occipital bone, clear? So whenever you are reading the norma occipitalis, you have, to, you have to keep in mind that you are going to deal with the parietal bones, you are going to have the occipital bone and you will have the temporal bone. But again the question comes here sometimes in exam that which part of the occipital bone is visible in norma occipitalis? Answer is squamous part. Now this is very commonly asked question and most of the students fail to attempt it that when we are talking about the norma occipitalis, we are dealing with the squamous part of occipital bone. Now what are the joints of the skull bones you are going to see in the norma occipitalis? So these joints are known as suture joint. So you will have the lambdoid suture. So this is the lambdoid suture and this lambdoid suture is present between the parietal bones and occipital bone. So this suture is present between the occipital and two parietal bones and here you will have again a very important question, what is sutural bones or warmian bones? So warmian bones or the sutural bones are present here when you will have the development of the accessory bone in this sutures. So some of the skulls will show the bones which are present in this lambdoid suture and these bones if present are known as sutural bones or warmian bones. Then you will have the next joint is between the occipital bone and mastoid part of the temporal bone and that is known as occipito mastoid suture. So this is your mastoid part of the temporal bone, this is occipital bone and this suture is known as occipito mastoid suture. Then you will have parieto mastoid suture. It lies between the parietal bone and mastoid bone. So this is your parieto mastoid suture. So parieto mastoid sutures are very small in case of norma occipitalis. Then you will have the posterior part of the sagittal suture which is visible here. Clear? So when we are talking about the sutures which are visible in the posterior view of the skull, First is the major portion is the lambdoid suture, then the pa part of your sagittal suture, then you will have the joint related to this temporal bone. This is known as occipitomastoid suture, this is parietomastoid suture. Now what are the features you are able to see in the norma occipitalis? So the first is lambda. Now you know that in the my class of norma verticalis, I already told you about the lambda that it is an intersection on the posterior end of your sagittal suture and lambdoid suture. At this point, you will have the posterior fontanelle in intrauterine life which uh, ossify by the age of 2 to 3 months after the birth. Now what is parietal foramina? You have the pair of the parietal foramina on both the side of your sagittal suture which are pass allow the passage of emissary vein. Now the center point of two parietal foramina is known as ovalion. Then you will have external occipital protuberance. 
Now, when we will talk about the external occipital protuberance, it is the lower part in midline. It is the lower prominence part in the midline. So, when you will see the midline, in lower part, you will find a prominence and this prominence is known as external occipital protuberance and this external occipital protuberance mark the junction of the neck. So, below that you will have the neck and above that you will have the head, clear? So, external occipital protuberance is present in the midline and it is a lower border where you will have the prominence. The most prominent part of external occipital protuberance is known as enion, clear? So, external occipital protuberance is having a point and that point of the protuberance is known as enion. Then you are having the two important lines on the uh, norma occipitalis which are most commonly asked question is knuckle lines. So, you will have superior knuckle line and highest knuckle line. So, here you can see that this is your external occipital protuberance and you will have the external occipital crest. Now, from the crest you are having the highest knuckle lines which are visible here and then you will have this superior knuckle line. Now, highest knuckle lines are not constant. Highest knuckle lines may be absent in the skull, but the superior knuckle lines are always a constant finding on the norma occipitalis. Now, these superior knuckle lines curve bony ridges and these ridges are going laterally from this protuberance which is present here and they also mark the junction of head and neck because I just told you that this external occipital protuberance is along with the superior knuckle line is a line of demarcation below that you will have the neck and above that you will have the head clear. The highest knuckle lines are not always present they are curved bony ridges situated about 1 centimeter above the superior knuckle line. So, this distance is roughly around 1 centimeter. They begins from the upper part of external occipital protuberance and they are more arch than the superior knuckle line. Clear? So, whenever you are reading the uh, uh, this norma occipitalis, you have to see the lines. But the middle line is known as superior knuckle line. Why I am saying this middle? Because on the lower part you also will find the inferior knuckle line also. But this inferior line is visible in norma basalis. But when you are talking about norma occipitalis, you will find the more prominence of the two curved lines and these are superior lines, which are the constant findings. Now, apart from that in norma occipitalis, you will find the mastoid foramen. So, you know that there is a suture is present and that suture is between the mastoid part of the temporal bone and parietal bone and this is known as parietomastoid suture. Now, just anterior to the parietomastoid suture, you will have a small foramen in the temporal bone and that is known as mastoid foramina. So, mastoid foramen is located in the mastoid part of the temporal bone or at the near of occipitomastoid suture it internally opens in the sigmoid sulcus. Now, you have to keep this thing in mind that this foramen also allows the passage of emissary vein and this emissary vein enters inside the cranial cavity where it is going to open into the sigmoid sinus which is present in the sigmoid sulcus. Apart from that, it also allows the meningeal branch of occipital artery. Then, the next feature is interparietal bone. Now, my dear students, the interparietal bones are also known as inca bones and these inca bones are different from the sutural bones. There are two things, one is the sutural bone, another is the inca bone. Now, these interparietal or the inca bones is a large triangular dermal bone. So, this is an example of dermal bone, this is the question. It is the example of dermal bone, but warmian bones or the sutural bones are not the dermal bones and they are located at the apex of squamous occipital part. Now, initially in the first slide I told you when you are having the norma occipitalis, which part of the occipital bone you will have answer is the squamous part. So, in this squamous part of occipital bone near the apex, here you will find the bones 
and these bones which are present in the occipital region are known as inca bones or interparietal bones and they lies above the highest knuckle line so these are the highest knuckle lines and above these highest knuckle line near the apex of this squamous part of occipital bone you are having the dermal bones these are not a sutural bone now this is my dear students you have to keep in mind most of the time the students are having this confusion that the sutural bones and inca bones are the same but they are not the same bones so these are not the sutural bones or the accessory bones but they represent the membranous part of occipital bone which has to failed to fuse with the rest of the bone my dear friends you have to understand that inca bones are the detached part of occipital bone inca bones are the detached part of the occipital bone and they remain at their place only but the only problem is that they fail to fuse with the main part of the squamous or occipital bone so that's why you will find that the lambdoid suture develops very well they have to do nothing with the lambdoid suture you know that lambdoid suture is a junction of the parietal bone and the occipital bone now these areas of inca bone are different from the Uh, sutural bones because they develops in this portion of occipital bone itself they are not developing here in the suture joint they are developing in the squamous part of occipital bone itself so the students are having this confusion that the inca bones and sutural bones are the same but they are not same why because the sutural bones are developing as a accessory bone but the inca bones are the part of the occipital bone itself which fails to fuse with the main part of the squamous part of occipital bone and they ossify later on and remain as a uh, detached portion of your occipital bone itself now what is the next is attachment on the your different areas of norma occipitalis so when you will see the occipital bone from the posterior side you will find a major muscle is trapezius along with that you have the ligamentum nuque now these two structures are attached on the external occipital protuberance so the upper portion of external occipital protuberance give origin to the trapezius while lower part give origin to the ligamentum nuque so in this diagram if you will see this is your upper origin of the trapezius and below you will have the origin of ligamentum nuque clear so upper part give origin to the trapezius lower part give origin to the ligamentum nuque ligamentum nuque is a midline structure now what are the attachment on superior knuckle lines now on the superior knuckle line when you will see from this point and if you will go laterally you will find three muscles this is the trapezius in the midline it is arising from external occipital protuberance but when you will go laterally it is arising from the medial part of the superior knuckle line now this lateral part of the superior knuckle line till the mastoid process is giving attachment to this sternocleidomastoid muscle and deep to this you will find this muscle which is known as splenius capitis so there are three muscles which are attached on the superior knuckle line medially trapezius laterally on the outer side sternocleidomastoid and deep to the sternocleidomastoid you will have splenius capitis so here you can see this whole is the length of superior knuckle line which is divided into the two part medial and lateral medial part is giving attachment to this trapezius lateral part superficially sternocleidomastoid and in deep splenius capitis now what is the attachment on highest knuckle line as i already told you that highest knuckle line may be absent if this line is absent then the attachment will go on the superior line by default so here you can see the posterior view where you have this is your highest knuckle line now on this highest knuckle lines you can see the two thing one is that the lateral side 
you are having the fibers and on the medial side you are having this white color area which is known as aponeurosis. So when you will see the highest knuckle line it will give on the medial side to this attachment of the galea aponeurotica or the aponeurosis of occipitofrontalis muscle while the lateral side of the superior knuckle lines will give attachment to the origin of occipital belly of occipitofrontalis muscle. Clear? So when you are talking about the highest knuckle line, if it is present, it provides attachment to the epicranial aponeurosis or it is also known as galea aponeurotica or aponeurosis of occipitofrontalis medially and laterally it will give origin to the occipital belly of occipitofrontalis muscle which you can appreciate and if this line is absent then these things will arise from this superior line clear so now at the end of this norma occipitalis that means from the posterior view of the skull you are able to understand that there is a major contribution of the occipital bone and on the occipital bone you have the important features like external occipital protuberance and superior and highest knuckle lines and you have the attachment of the muscles on these lines which you have to understand because so many times you have these questions and in the viva also you have the marking on these lines to write down the answers regarding their attachments. So this is all for the session. Thank you.